Hi everyone, so in this video we're going to go ahead and discuss measurements in science, different ways we can describe them, and then also how we should be recording them when we are in the laboratory. So let's go ahead and get started. So one way that we can describe measurements is whether they're qualitative or quantitative. So qualitative measurements are things that are descriptive and do not involve numbers. So colors, textures, um, if it feels hot or cold, things like that. Um, are all qualitative measures. Quantitative measures are things that involve numbers. So the way I think about it, quantitative has an N in it, qualitative does not. So that's how we know which one involves numbers. So some examples of quantitative measurements are 25 centimeters, 500 pounds, or 400 Kelvin. Okay, so to work through an example, Fiona the hippopotamus was born six weeks early at the Cincinnati Zoo on January 24th, 2017. She weighed only 29 pounds at birth. The average newborn hippo weighs between 55 and 110 pounds. So some qualitative descriptions of Fiona is that she is a hippopotamus. She has um, brown kind of smooth skin. We can also say that she was born premature, that she had a very low birth weight, and she was very small. Now some quantitative measurements would be that she only weighed 29 pounds. Um, she was less than half the weight of the typical hippopotamus, and she was born six weeks early. All of those involve numbers, so they're quantitative measurements. So we can also describe measurements using the terms accurate and precise. So in everyday conversation, these terms have pretty similar meanings, but they do take on different meanings once we get into the laboratory. So precise is how close a group of numbers or measurements are to one another. Not to the true value, but how closely are they grouped to one another? Accurate describes how close a group of numbers or measurements are to the true correct value. So one way to think about it is kind of with a bullseye target. So in the middle is where we want to be. That's the true accurate location. And we can think about how closely those numbers are to one another, or in this case, the, bull the error points. So the one on the left I have them grouped tightly together, so we know they are precise, and they're also grouped in the middle where we want them to be, so they're accurate. The next picture, those arrow points are still closely grouped together, but now they're off to the upper right-hand corner, so they're no longer accurate. They're not in that middle where we want them to be, but they're still closely grouped together, meaning they're precise. In the third picture, they're all kind of centered around the middle, but they're not tightly grouped. So they are not precise, but they are accurate because they're still close to that true value. And then the final one, they are neither accurate nor precise. They're not closely grouped. They're not centered around that middle bullseye location. Okay, so a really important skill is accurately recording measurements in lab. So it depends on partially on what type of equipment we have. If we have a digital instrument, something that gives us the exact numbers, such as your cell phone, um, electronic balances, your calculator, those are all digital instruments. We're going to read and record the numbers exactly as they are given to us, including any extra zeros that might be present after the decimal point. In contrast, scaled instruments, these are things where you have to do the work to figure out the number yourself. So a ruler, a graduated cylinder, um, an old fashioned balance that doesn't have that um, digital readout. Those are all things that we need to use the scaled instrument idea where we estimate one more figure than we can actually definitively know from the scale. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually work through an example of this. So pretend that I am measuring this blue line and I have my ruler. Now the blue line falls between the five and the six. So I'm going to need to estimate the tenths place. So I'm going to mentally divide the five and the six um, distance between those two up into 10 equal size pieces. Now to help us out, I actually have it drawn out. So here we can see the answer for this is going to be right about 5.5. .5. Now, depending upon who you ask, you might get slightly different answers. So maybe your neighbor says, I really think it's more like 5.4, or someone else says 5.6. That's okay, you're gonna have slightly different values for that last answer, although they should be kind of clustered together. 
but the first number, that five, should be the same because it is an accurate number given to us on our um, instrument. Now, if we had a ruler that already had the tenths place marked, like most rulers do, then we would need to go to the hundredths place, okay? So we have to go one more place past whatever is marked. And if you need help with this, please let me know. One really important skill when it comes to um, recording measurements in the lab is dealing with liquids because liquids, such as water, will form a meniscus when they're poured into a container. This is because the liquid will have the attraction between itself and other um, molecules of that same liquid and also between the molecules of the liquid and the sides of the container. So we get this meniscus, which is a curve in the liquid that forms due to surface tension. So when we are measuring volume, the first thing we want to do is place the container on a flat surface. If it's on something that's crooked or we're holding it up in the air, you're going to get an inaccurate measurement. So place on a flat surface like the counter works really well. You then want to look at the meniscus at eye level. And this means you might need to bend down to look at it. You don't want to look at it from up above. You also don't want to be looking up at it. So you're going to need to go ahead and adjust your height so you're looking straight on at the meniscus. And then we're going to record the value of the liquid from the bottom of the meniscus, not from the top or from the middle, from the bottom or the lowest point of the meniscus. And then finally, don't forget to estimate that last digit. Okay, so here we have an example of a liquid. We see that we have the big markings of 40 up to 50, and it is divided into the ones place with each of those individual lines. So we need to go ahead and estimate one place value plus past the ones place, which is the tenths place. So I think this looks really, really close to being right on that 43 line. So maybe it's a little bit above. I'm going to say, eh, Right about 43.0 milliliters. Now, maybe you said 43.1 or 43.2 or maybe even 42.9 or 0.8. Any of those would be valid readings and they're all acceptable because each of us is estimating that last value. But when we go ahead and round it to two place values, we all get the same answer. Another really important skill is using a balance so we can get those accurate mass values. One thing to be aware of is you don't want to lean on the counter when you are weighing objects. The extra force that you are putting on the counter can actually transfer to the balance and affect the reading. So you want to make sure that you're not touching the counter um, if at all possible. I also recommend that you avoid using the tear feature. It's much, much better to go ahead, weigh the total mass, and then subtract out the mass of the single container or the object, because then we can go ahead and um, have all that data in case we need to go back and make some corrections. Also, make sure you're using the same balance throughout an experiment. Oftentimes, balances can have slightly different calibration values. So if you use the same one, you're going to be more consistent and have better data. Also, make sure you're never weighing chemicals directly on the balance. There should always be something between the metal of the balance and your chemical. So examples include weighing paper, a weigh boat, or a watch glass. This is just because you want to avoid contaminating, contaminating the balance because you never know what someone else might have had on it before or what might be going on to it next. And then finally, please be very careful not to spill on the balance but if you do spill something, it's really important that you clean it up immediately so you don't damage the balance. Okay, so I hope this answers your questions about measurements in science and how to record different measurements in the lab. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. Otherwise, you can go ahead and try out the practice activities. Bye, everyone.